Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Today's Monday, January 6, 2020. I was asked by a parent to share about our philosophy behind and the benefit from attending our parent support groups as often as possible, and also the idea of getting a home therapist. I do get that question quite a bit from families. Questions like, what do we work on? Um, what, do we, what do we tell them we're, we're there for? Why do we need one at home? while our child is away. And so we, with that backdrop, I'll, I'll talk about that tonight. And again, I think it really does go at the core of a lot of what we think to be the most effective thing that you can do to help your child in this process. I love the quote by Ram Dass, who, as some of you may know, just passed away a couple of weeks ago. It's a very simple and, and, and powerful statement about the work that we do. He said, I can do nothing for you but work on myself. And you can do nothing but me, nothing for me, but work on yourself, Ram Das. Um, th there's no truer words that have been spoken. Um, it's the most important contribution. And, and if we can get past our, our guilt and our shame uh, uh, associated with blame, then we, we can lean into this work, right? We can, if we can, we can separate out, and most of us can't, or at least we struggle with it. We can't separate out the idea that I have some work to do that, that will contribute to this to, to this progress, Me, meaning implying I have some un, unfinished or undone work that is a part of the problem. And, and because we're so conditioned to feel badly about that, which is really just feeling badly about being human, we create a defense around the whole thing, right? We, we, we create a defense where we, we tell ourselves, we, we justify, we rationalize, we gather evidence to, to prove to ourselves and to those around us that we're not part of the problem. Now, I created a graphic for this that I usually talk about when I'm doing the podcast version of this. I talk about it visually using my two fists, my two hands, but I've drawn it here for those of you that are watching the, the, the webinar version of this. And the, the, the question with this graphic is, what is your work? And if you can imagine, if you're listening to this on the podcast app, if you can imagine holding your fists out in front of your face about a foot apart or so, and your left, left fist represents how you respond to things, how you responded yesterday, how you're inclined or, or most likely to respond, what's your instinct in a certain situation. So that represents your left fist. And to the right, about a foot, foot away from that is the ideal response. Um, where you uh, aspire to respond, how you aspire to respond or hope to respond in a situation. And, and also, what is most helpful? And I think that that might be the most important question is what can I do that's going to be the most helpful? So there's some distance. And in my visualization, you have about a foot of distance between each of your two fists that you're holding out. And the space in between is the work. That simple. Whatever it is that it takes to get from here on the left side to here on the right side is your work. And, and I don't know what that is for you, but that's the question. Why do I not tend to respond with patience? Why do I not tend to respond with love, with compassion, with curiosity? Why, why can't I respond slowly and, and with forethought? And all the, the, the answers to those questions are where your work lies. Now, it's most important because those of us who are in this situation with children at Evoke, we have children that are, because of their struggles, they're particularly taxing, right? They, they, they require more energy, more resources from us. And so this is true. This statement is true of, of the typical child, right? The, the average child, the child that doesn't end up in a therapeutic program like Evoke. But how much more true is it uh, of children that do end up in situations like this? I was asked today during a radio interview about the, the heroic journey title of my book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent. And, and the, the interviewer said the thing that so many people ask me when they, when they inquire about the, the title of the book. Uh, it was a woman. She said, I, I don't want to be a heroic parent. I just want to be good enough, an adequate parent. And I said, well, I, I think the word is important. I think the, the heroic journey is important because it is exceptional that a parent 
be willing to consider that they, their approach, their dynamic is a part of the problem. And being willing to, to ask and to look into yourself. I had a parent ask in the open forum that we had just, just the other day. She said, you know, my, my son's accused me in the past of, of guilting him when really I just thought I, I was sharing my feelings with him and setting a boundary. It was something like that. And I said to this parent, I, I perceived it was a mother for whatever reason. I said to her, I said, your son is lucky to have you. The fact that you'd be willing to consider that you might be doing something unconsciously, really, that's courageous. The, 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 the fear of, of looking into the unconscious is great for all of us. And, and we build the defense so that we don't have to look at that. So it is a heroic process, a heroic journey to go inside of yourself, to look at yourself. Simple as that. That's what the hero's journey is about in mythology and, and, and storytelling. It's the willingness to look at yourself and explore that inner landscape. I, I talk about this all the time. If you don't get support, especially with a child who, who is, is trying, like your child most likely is if they're here, if you don't get support and you don't make serenity your responsibility, you'll end up trying to get it from your child. Simple as that. You will do things and say things to try to get them to shape up and, and fly right in a certain way so that you feel okay, so that you can sleep at night, so that you can eat and concentrate at work and give your attention to the other people in your life. So it's critical. You know, people who, who don't think they need to, who don't take the vulnerable step, step to ask for help and ask for supporting community, who, who, who really would, would describe themselves, if asked, as selfless in so many ways, as if, as if selfless is some kind of goal to aspire to. In psychology, it, it's actually the opposite of what we would aspire to. But the, the, the person that would describe themselves as selfless will end up stealing from others, particularly their children. And the child is, is wired. It's, it's very nature is wired to take care of the parent because, and it's simple, simple genetics. If the child becomes too much of a burden, they risk abandonment, period. Now, they can't and wouldn't articulate this. They don't until they come to therapy years later and tell their own children they're struggling, right? Those are the parents that I work with. Um, so they wouldn't articulate it or, or probably even resonate with what I just said, but it's there. It's just a fact of being human. So what happens is if they don't take up the, 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 the charge to take care of mom and dad, if they don't do that, they'll feel horrible. They'll feel like a failure. They'll either turn it inward and it'll come, come out as, as depression and anxiety, or they'll get angry and rebel against it, fight against it. Self-medication, whatever version of self-medication one chooses, whether it's substances or, or, or self-harm or just acting out and getting in trouble so as to distract from the more authentic suffering, whatever the self-medicating behavior is, it's there in part to take away that critical inner voice. That sense that we have that we're not okay, that we're not enough, that we're too much. So it's critical. It's critical that we look into our own woundedness, that we look into our own unfin unfinished business. It's never been the child's responsibility to take care of the parent. It is why, that is why it is so imperative that you make the, the care of yourself the priority. And, and, and know this, expect this, people that you love will accuse you of abandoning them, of, of being selfish. That's the way that it works. That's the, the, the sentinel that guards self-care, right? So you're going to have to walk past that sentinel to do this. But if you're starving to death emotionally, emotionally or spiritually, spiritually, you can't be there for other people. You have an empty cup. 
to offer everybody else. So developing a routine of self-care and practice, doing battle with guilt, I say this all the time. I don't know of a way towards self-care that doesn't involve for me some guilt. I don't know one. So if I'm not struggling, doing some battle with guilt, I'm probably not making progress in self-care. Alice Miller said that oftentimes in raising children, we try to get something from them that we already lost a long time ago. Right? We try to get a sense of, of being their everything, of being, being admired by them and loved by them. We're really trying to get something from the child that we should have received from our parents. And you, it won't work. And it will hurt them. Right? Being a parent, being a grandparent is not the same as being the child. The goal of a parent is to give, to support, to love, to be there for the child. And while the child, as they grow and as the parent ages, can be there for the parent, not in, in, in early development, not in the periods of life when the parent is perhaps tempted to make their own emotional well, well-being the child's responsibility. It doesn't work. It's destructive. I said this already. Most children are medicating. The medication is the voice of, in their head that says that they're not okay. That voice can originate from the culture, from the peers, from media, or from the parents. So we have to find out how much we're doing that to our children. And we're all doing it more than we would like. It's okay. It's part of being human. I've been studying this stuff for three decades now. And I've done it much more than I would like to, like to admit and own up to at times. I said this earlier, the heroic parent is one who is willing to consider their contribution to the issue. I think it's harder for dads sometimes, maybe. It's harder for dads because we're, we can be more, our egos can be more fragile. It's harder for moms in the sense that mom's socialization is around their value, is around how well the children are doing. So we both have kind of different constructs, different makeups that make us vulnerable to this dynamic in a certain way, the, the, the willingness to look at our, our own issue. Many of us grew up in a home where it was about power and control and who was right and who was wrong. So if we, if we come with that paradigm, then we're afraid that, that rightness and wrongness are kind of um, limited resources, right? They're, 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 they cancel each other out. So if I'm right, you're wrong. It, it, we, can, we both can't be right and we both can't be wrong. So we play the right and wrong game in our families with our children. But, but this way, this therapy way of thinking is, you know, the way I say it is, take 100% responsible for 2% of the, of the equation. I, I taught this to my therapist during our training today. We do therapy for, uh, video conference calls with our therapists to, to do training. And I was saying to them, this work doesn't take away your sense of self. It's actually built on your sense of self. You actually show up stronger, more clear, with better boundaries in this work. The foundation of being right is a scary, treacherous foundation to stand on. But the foundation of self is strong and firm and grounded. So it's a shift. The heroic parent doesn't see the issue or the problem out there, but sees it in here. Right? That's, that's what the enlightened mind is. It says, the, the, the thing that is in the way of my happiness is me. Things in the way of my success is me. That doesn't mean that we won't grieve with pain and sadness and loss. But we won't run from it. I saw, a, a, I thought, a very fascinating movie last night that some of you might might have seen called Jojo Rabbit. And there was a, a quote by Rilke at the end of the movie that said, that they printed on the screen during the credits, and it said something like this, let everything happen to you, both beautiful and, and, and horrific. I'm kind of messing up the quote. 
no feeling is final, right? We, we, we feel, we go through life. We don't run from it. We see the pain as a part of the love that we feel. We, we see the sadness as a part of caring. The hurt is a, a part of being a, a whole person. So it doesn't inoculate us against pain. In fact, if you want to escape pain, try drugs. They work really well until you die. I said to somebody just yesterday that alcohol is a fantastic solution to your problems, except for it kills you and ruins your life on, on the way there. Except for those two things, it's a wonderful solution. Why work? You work in part for support. Again, I think most of us come into parenting and we think love is going to be a, the solution pretty close to, to all of it. And then we look at the, the, the models from our parents and from others that we didn't like. And we say, well, I'm going to avoid those things. And we come in with those two thought process and we think that that's enough. And I, I don't know why. I don't know why there is so little formal education around parenting in our curriculum, right? in our lives. You've got to seek it out. It's seen as a weakness by some people. But yet it's the most, along with marriage, the most difficult thing in the world in connection with the most important thing in the world. And we think we're supposed to wing it. Think about anything else in your life that's important and difficult and then th thinking about winging it. It's insane. But we have shame associated with, with the need, so... That's how we do it. We do work for wisdom, right? To learn things about ourselves. I cannot tell you, for those of you that are new, this might sound strange, it often does. For, you, those, of, for those of you that aren't new, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. People that go through this process will say to me, somewhere down the line, I'm so glad that all of, all of this happened to me. I would not wish it upon my enemy, but... It has saved my life. It's made my marriage better. Made my parenting of my other children better. Made me a better um, person at work, in my friendships, in my family of origin. I wish there was another way. But there's not a lot of, lot of other ways that are as compelling as a struggling child. So we, we get wisdom from this experience. We, we unlearn things that we were taught that we just thought for sure were true. We consider things that we'd never been, uh, that we were told to fear to consider. That's essentially, I told a, a mother that today who was considering our program. I said, your child is, is trying to escape your childhood. They're basically saying to you that the way you were raised and, and kind of what you came into parenting with isn't working for me. It's, it's actually really harming me. And I'm going to get out of it one way or the other. We, we work for hope. And most importantly, the hope comes from one fundamental shift. From an external locus of control, that, that is things outside of me will make the difference, to an internal locus of control. To I can make the biggest difference in my life. It's not what happened to me. But it's what I choose to do, my practice. Uh, hoping for things outside of your control leads to depression, anxiety. Hope inside of your control, focusing on that leads to an empowerment. I, I remember when I was a, I was a mid-teenager, when I was first introduced to, to the serenity prayer that they use in 12-step groups. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That prayer is said at virtually every 12-step group all over the world every day. And I remember thinking, what does that have to do with sobriety? That seems random. Right? Focusing on what I can control and what I can't control doesn't seem like it's relative. But, but of course, after the years, it makes all the sense in the world. It's really a fundamental drive in all of us. It's what drives people, some people, to seek for control through intimidation and power, coercion. 
or 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 leads to ultimately the liberating feeling and sensation of surrender. All right, and you, you to get to surrender, you pass through some kind of hopelessness and despair often. So if you if you feel hopeless, and and I think many of the parents that are at this point in their lives with us, they're right around hopeless. And what I would say is, that's a good direction. It makes sense that you're hopeless because the things that you're hoping for you can't control, and they're the most frightening things in the world, specifically the health and well-being of your child. Skills and tools. I was reminded today by by a mentor of mine that just not everybody thinks the way that I think. I like to think from idea to tool. I'm not a tool guy, but uh, Sanford Shapiro, who's a, a cognitive scientist, my, one of my mentors, said to me today, reminded me, Brad, sometimes people work best from tools. Sometimes they learn best by a mastery of the tools before they get or understand the concept. And it was a a great reminder, again, that not everybody is like me. You work to model working and vulnerability. I think one of the simplest tools that you can use with your child to help in the process is find something to apologize from. Not from a place of self-deprecation and self-flagellation and self-abuse, but from a place of strength, from a place of, yeah, I've screwed up. I've done too much of this or too little of that. And I'm open to what else you have to say. Again, not compromising your boundaries. Just imagine that. Imagine being able to say you're sorry, genuinely sorry for for being a part of the problem without feeling like then you have to compromise boundaries, give up, lessen limits. You can still keep those as firmly and clearly as you would like. We do work to build community. You know, I go back to work every week with my therapist to sit with somebody who gets me. So I'm not alone. At least for one hour a week, I'm not alone. More, of course, on most weeks. But at least for one hour a week, because of my practice, I'm not alone. And then work is its own reward. You know, the work is joy. Heaven is here now. Peace is available to us now. And the thing that's in the way of it is us. It's not an easy, it's not a light switch that you turn on. I gave the example today when I was talking about the feeling statements with my therapist that if I went to touch somebody, touch you on your shoulder, and because you had been abused by some male in your life, you may, in this, in this example, you would kind of flinch in fear. In that scenario, it wouldn't be accurate to say that you're a, that you chose to be afraid. You don't choose your feelings, not in the way that we choose a a, a, um, a dinner item. But over time, with work, you can work your way through that. You can come to learn over time, months, sometimes years, that not everybody that touches you is going to hurt you. So in that way, you can choose out of it, but. It, it's more about taking ownership for it. Um, home therapy. A lot of people ask me why and, and what. First of all, share your story. Share the story of, of your child with your therapist. It's their job to kind of make sense out of it. Um, it's your place to take care of you. Because like I said earlier, if you don't take care of you, guess who's going to feel the pull to do it? And guess how much harm that has on them. Immense harm. So take care of you. One hour a week, you get to be you. If your therapist is impatient and in a hurry to, to cure you or fix you, get a new therapist. Or at least explain to them that that's not what you need. You need a place where you don't have to get it right. See, that's the deal with therapy. It's, it's, it's a different context. It's a place where you don't have to get it right. You don't even have to make progress in therapy. It's the one place in your life 
where you don't have to make progress in therapy, unless, of course, the therapist's fragile ego requires it of you because they need to feel good about themselves because they just want to be a paid parent, really, in those cases. So share with them how you feel and make it a safe place. Share the letters that you get from your child and the ones that you write to them. And that can be a part of the assignments, right? You can share with them the assignments that are happening in the parent portal, that are happening uh, from, from the therapist assigning to you each week, different kinds of letters and responses, and just share them with them. Sit in session and read them. See, any adequate therapy is your hour. The deal in therapy is you pay for the time, end of deal. If more is required of you, and of course the therapist, if they feel unsafe or abused, they can terminate therapy. But outside of, of extraordinary cases like that, you don't owe them anything. You don't have to do it their way. You don't have to be polite. I remember one time I had a, a young man who's a young adult apologize for missing a session and I said, or coming late, and I said, it doesn't matter to me. You don't have to come on time. He, he knew my policy about billing, so I was going to bill him either way. So why apologize to me for the time that you paid for? I don't need anything else from you. That's the deal in therapy. So share assignments. Let your therapist encourage, sign a release of information to have your therapist at a vote, talk with your home therapist and talk about what they're working on, what they're seeing in the child, what they're seeing in the parent-child dynamic. Most importantly, have it be the starting place, the beginning place for your journey of recovery from your mental illness, your addiction, or, or your codependency. And I know those words sound jarring and dramatic, but it's just what they are. You have some in you. We all do. We all have attachment wounds and some trauma, some much more than others, but we all have that stuff. And so... Therapy is a place to sort it out, to make sense out of it, to unravel it, to see how it's contributing to the dynamics, the issues, the relationships that we're dealing with, with today. Parent support groups. Now, we don't do parent support groups in every city in the United States. We do them in a lot of the major hubs, and so you may not have one close to you. I always say, plan a trip to Los Angeles or New York or San Francisco or Chicago, where we have them regularly, or Toronto. Um, plan a trip there and make a weekend of it if, you, if you'd like, but, but, um, or if we come to your city and we try to come to the other cities, um, as often as we're able to, um, but you come to parent support groups for community, right? To, to, to share your story in a room where people don't give you stupid advice, right? Where people aren't condescending toward you. Where people aren't giving you pat answers. You come partly for education because there's, we teach, the therapist will, will teach, kind of use the, the sharing as a platform to teach the relevant principles involved in, in the experience of, of parenting a child struggling with mental health or addiction. You come to share and to take away experience, strength, and hope. That's a phrase from the 12 step community. You Sometimes you draw on people's experience, strength, and hope. Sometimes you share your experience, strength, and hope. And, and in sharing, you become stronger and you lift other people up. I like to think of it the way that I think about all of these things. You know, it's like a podcast in person. Because you're, you're reconnecting with the sensibility, the way of thinking. People tell me all the time, my daughter just told it to me today because I did. She was on the, the the phone call. She was trying to guess what I'd say next when I was asked a, a question, and that's a, that's the same thing I do with my therapist. I, I try to try to see if I can think different than the way that I was taught by my family, by my culture, growing up. So you're learning to think differently. My wife, we had a. We had an argument a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. She was, she had some conflict around bedtime with our, our, our 12 year old. 
So my wife comes to bed and she's kind of venting about the experience and asking me for my advice. And I'm like, I, I don't know for sure. Didn't really know, wasn't there, don't know what to tell you. And she said, you're holding back. I know you, you have great ideas, please tell me. And I said, I suppose, after a while, I said, I suppose if I were gonna give you advice, my advice would be to just be different. You can imagine that didn't go over too well, but we've laughed about it ever since. Because it really is the advice, just be different. Show up in the world differently. Think differently. Have a different relationship with yourself, with your child, with your child's struggles. And that's a, that's a deep, hard thing to do. It, it takes months and years. You get hope before then because you, you, you know that there's a different project. And so the hope can come earlier. The hope can come after a month or two. But I said it to the therapist today on, on our training phone call. It's a lifetime of work. It's the rest of your life's work. It's a practice. It's a way of living. So you reconnect, re-immerse yourself in the sensibility. You come to support others. We, we learn most by teaching sometimes. And mostly by supporting others, it's not giving them advice or solutions, but it's just listening, letting them know that they're not alone, not having an answer in most cases. I had a therapist asked on the call today, we were talking about some relational principle and she said to me, she asked the question, so, you know, when's the line between compromise and, and um, working together with somebody versus you know, setting a boundary and saying, I can't have you in my life. You know, where's that line? And my response was, you're right. That's the right question. And I don't know the answer. I can't, I can't possibly know the answer for you. But that's the right question to be asking for the rest of your life. Can I be myself around this person? Can I compromise and still be okay? Can I make sacrifices and still be okay? Can I bend without breaking? You come to support others. You know, um, you lay your burdens down there. One mother said to me, you know, the support groups, AA, Al-Anon, people just go there to complain. And I said, yes, that's right. That's the perfect place to go to complain. You get to complain. And so you really do provide a container for other people. When I'm listening to you at a support group, or in therapy for that matter, it's the listening that's the gift. Any schmo can give advice, solutions. Right? That's easy. Dime a dozen. But listening, listening to understand, that takes something. And that's a real gift to give to somebody. I have to remember myself when I'm with parents or a client to, to, to just listen and to be stingy with answers to questions about right and wrong and, and what to do for sure. And, and to practice saying, I don't know. If I knew how to fix your kid, if I knew how to the switch to flip so your kid would be okay, do you, I would tell you. And so would everybody else. It would be clear. Parent workshops, we, we, we stop just short of saying that everybody has to go to these. The only reason we don't say everybody has to go to parent workshops is because we would lose some people on the front end who eventually will come to a parent workshop. But essentially, we would like all parents to come to a parent workshop. We hold them once a month, so talk to your Evoke therapist about it. You can combine them with a visit to the field if the timing is right. So once a month at one of our two sites. It's multifamily, meaning several sets of parents or individuals, all, all serving in a parent role with, with the child in the program. So they come, they get psychoeducation, training, skill building, skill practice. They even learn some wilderness skills like how to bust a fire by rub, rubbing sticks together. 
seeing how hard that is. They talk to each other. You you learn that the there's there's other normal people in your same predicament. It's a really nice thing to discover, to be introduced to. You're not alone. You're you're not. And I'm with you. In it. Not a part of it, not above it, but but we're in this together. You learn about family systems work, right? That the idea is you come to the program, and if you, if you combine it with a visit, which happens more than half the time, if you combine it with a visit to the field to see your child, it just becomes the work. I, I don't know if it's celebration, congratulations, to kind of practice the things you've been practicing in letters and at the workshop, if it's to deal with something difficult that you've never had success with, right? To hold a boundary in the face of great fear and anxiety. I don't know what the work is, but it's the work. And so it could be anything. The only problem is, is when you come attached to it being a certain thing. The greatest work I've done in the field with families, and this is not even a question. The most memorable, profound work I've ever done with families is when it absolutely did not go as planned or as we anticipated. That was almost always some of the most important work. So you learn about fa family systems. You do that work out there. And you get to see the field and the field staff. There's something about the experience that you can't get any other way. Now taking it to another level. I believe in intensives. I believe in it as much as I believe in anything. I have paid for many, many people to go to intensives in my, in my life. My family, of course my therapists and employees, friends even, I believe in intensives. I pay myself full price to go to an intensive every year. Think of an intensive as a deeper dive, a springboard if you're new to the work, kind of setting up what, what the project of the work is, or an accelerator if you've done a, a good deal of work. And I've, I've had these two serve both roles in my life. If you're ready for more work, that's really the only qualification for an intensive is if you think that there is work, you don't have to know what it is. You don't have to have any idea of it, but you have a sense that there's something and you're ready. And believe me, everybody is terrified of intensives. We lost almost half our group over the weekend, this weekend, prior to coming, right? We, we were full with a waiting list. And now we have a, an empty spot in the group because people get afraid. They, they, they probably have stories, excuses, things that have, that have come up, but, but people are afraid. Everybody tells me that on the beginning. And you know what everybody tells me at the end? It's the best thing I ever did. I wish everybody would, would do it. I was so terrified when I came. And I don't want to leave because this is the safest place I've ever been in my life. That's all I can tell you is that almost universally, that is the experience. It's like six months of therapy in four and a half days. Time is on your side because you're not in a hurry because these sessions go for, they go over a course of five days, but it's about four and a half days, maybe four and three quarters. It's, it's all day, every day. There's no hurry. It's not one or even two hour sessions. You have breaks, of course, but it's, it's all day. You essentially look at your family of origin, your, your, your life growing up and how it's playing itself out today in your relationships. That's essentially what it is. And it becomes clear. It can be related to your children or not. It doesn't have to be. It actually is the same work. I, I, I tell you, you know, I go to therapy. I've had the same therapist for 22 years now. And um, it's all the same work, whether I have a child that's struggling, which I've had, or I'm struggling in my marriage, which has happened, or I'm stressed out at work, which happens, or I'm going through a period where I'm discouraged, all of that has happened, or I'm not struggling at all and I'm happy. It's all the same work. It's a joy. I look forward to my sessions each week, and I didn't always. I did them at first because I had no other alternative. 
I did them later on because I needed help. And it was the only thing I knew that, that, that might help. And now I do it now because it's my hour. And I can't, for one hour a week, I don't have to take care of anybody else, including, most importantly, my therapist. So that's the intensive work, is you get to do that with five or six other people for four and a half, five days, and it's yours. And it's, it's, it is the most impactful thing I think you can do for your child. And I don't think there's a close second, except for, except for make your work, your lifelong project. I suppose that's the, the thing, the best thing, but this is a part of that, right? Your work is all you can do. This is the take home. This is all you can do is your work. You, sur you surrender to that which you cannot control. And like I said, you often walk through feelings of hopelessness and despair on your way to surrender or, or as a part of surrender. You learn to not know things. It's really the greatest thing in the world to learn to not know things, to not have simple answers. You accept that you can't fix someone else, which doesn't paralyze you which doesn't make you weaker and more passive. It makes you stronger and more assertive and more clear and more honest and more authentic and more bold and more powerful. What you can do, although you can't fix somebody else, is you can contribute to other people's well-being. You can make an impact on others. You can influence others to some degree. You can model for people what it means to take off your armor and do your own work. And you can avoid being a part of the problem. Any live questions that come up, go ahead and send those in now. I'm going to go over the upcoming announcements and then I'll take those before we end tonight. A parent workshop. The next one is January 25th and 26th in Southern Utah. So if you possibly can go, please come RSVP to Melanie at evoketherapy.com. The next parent support group that I have on the schedule is in New York City on January 27th. Come see a couple of shows. Ask me about shows. I can give you my recommendations. That'll be at Midtown on um, Fifth Avenue and 34th Street at the CUNY building, the Graduate Center there. Uh, again, Melanie at evoketherapy.com is for the information. Like I said, we have a spot open up if you want to come last minute. <laughs> um, this Wednesday, January 8th through 12th, Finding You. Uh, and then in February, February 19th, first week in March and so forth and so on. I'm going to be doing one in England. March 8th through 10th. So if you have relatives, friends, contacts in England, let them know we did one earlier. We did one last year. It was fantastic, wonderful. Finding you too. We have those on the schedule. April 16th through 19th and July 15th through 19th. We have customized intensives for couples, families, professionals, and individuals. Intensives at evoketherapy.com is the place to go. Pursuit trips are adventure trips, kind of light therapy, sober fun, for young adults or for families, if you want to do something outdoors anywhere in the world. We ask all current families to attend, at least just try six 12-step support groups, any combination of Al-Anon, Codependence Anonymous, Families Anonymous. You can go to adult children if you grew up in, an, in a particularly toxic home. Alateen is for teenagers. Refuge Recovery is a Buddhist-inspired recovery program. Less of an emphasis on a higher power. And NAMI.org is a place to go for free resources and classes in your local area. All of these broadcasts are available on the podcast app by searching Evoke Therapy Program. We're actually going to change that name soon because uh, by about tomorrow evening this time, we'll be at a half a million listens. So we're going to celebrate by changing the name, being a little bit more creative. You can listen to our, our uh, podcast on the iPhone, iOS device using the podcast app on an Android device using the SoundCloud app or go to soundcloud.com. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find Evoke Therapy programs by using the handle at Evoke Therapy or the intensive program you can find on Instagram by using Evoke Summit Lodge as the handle. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy programs. The Alumni Foundation, the organization that helps people that can't afford therapy, can be found on Facebook by searching Evoke Family Foundation. Then, of course, our blog is available. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon, also Audible and on your Kindle device there. So 
Any questions before I wrap up this evening? Looks like none have come in. So um, when we're going to go back to what we've been, what we did for years. So every other one will be a Q and A. If I do two in a week, I'll do a Q and a Q and A. So please send in, send in questions in advance. Any question is welcome. Have siblings attend, extended family attend. They can ask any questions. You can ask questions about them for them. Any of your friends even can can attend if you want them to have some exposure and to understand what your family is going. Uh, have them come to the question and answer this Thursday evening, January eighth um at 7 p.m mountain time so thursday january 8th 7 p.m mountain time thank you for joining us i i thank you there's a nice group in attendance this evening i thank you for your participation for those of you listening on the podcast app i thank you for and on behalf of all of your loved ones particularly your children because your work is the biggest difference you can make for them that you have control over so thank you for the vulnerability and willingness to look at yourself have a great week, and I'll talk to you in a couple of days. Take care. Bye-bye.